The very definition of alternative currency, I think, is you know something we could debate. And and what is an alternative currency? You could look at like the use of shells, or、um, you know ancient stones or other primitive. Currencies that that go back to before things like governmental currencies even existed. For me, the definition really is joined with the idea of a government issued currency, like the idea that there is an alternative to the formal or official legal tender. So I think the alternative currency that's most interesting is really a class of、uh, alternative currencies in countries like England called merchant tokens. Which were developed by businesses a few hundred years ago to basically、um, solve the fact that there just weren't a lot of small denomination coins in circulation. You can think of like today. Imagine if we didn't have any pennies or nickels. Merchants basically stepped in and created small coins to kind of grease the wheels of commerce. The King of England did try to ban merchant tokens. But interestingly, the ban only worked temporarily. The fundamental economic need for merchant tokens、uh, persisted despite the ban, and I think that says something interesting about how far regulation can go. If you don't solve the economic problem or gap that something like a merchant token or alternative currency is filling, then you should expect it probably to return. There were some common themes that led to the creation of alternative currencies: some kind of economic disruption,、uh, a loss of confidence in the financial system, or even just a shortage of currency.、Uh, we had、um, deflation and, and, and basically a shrinking of the money supply in the 1930s. That was a big part of why we had a depression. Communities stepped in to create their own currency. You had people who were ready to work, but there was no money to pay them. Um, and so you saw local economies basically try to invent,、um, you know, local currencies, and these became quite popular. They flourished in the 1930s. But as we came out of the Great Depression, that problem, that shortage of money,、um, you know, the lack of employment, started to abate, and we saw these alternative currencies, which couldn't be used like in the town next door、uh, or across the country. We saw them start to、um, basically disappear. I think today, you know, no one would argue that our financial system and money are as efficient as they could be. You know, if you send an email or a text message, it's free and almost instantaneous, pretty much、uh, anywhere around the world. Whereas if you try to, you know, spend money or transfer money, you can pay three, five, over ten percent even in, in fees and foreign exchange conversion costs. It's not as、uh, fast and efficient and easy to use. As something like text messaging and email, yet there's no theoretical reason it shouldn't be. So, I think alternative currencies do offer、um, competition to our traditional forms of money. This morning, we unsealed an eight-count indictment charging Samuel Bankman-Fried, FTX's founder, with a series of interrelated fraud schemes that contributed to FTX's collapse. There's a A lot of volatility, so the lack of a, a central bank behind a cryptocurrency or alternative currency to stabilize、uh, the exchange rate, I think, is a big trade-off. So there are, I think, a lot of risks with anything that is new and、um, less proven. Having said that,、um, there's also tremendous opportunities, and so it's easy to look at something like FTX and assume the whole cryptocurrency space is bad, when in fact it's actually just a classic case of embezzlement. And、uh, you know we can see that in banks, you can see that in insurance companies, in, in government, and in, in many settings around the world. This is all very new still. The future is uncertain. We need better regulation, more clarity.、Um, we're still in the very early days, but I think the story of alternative currencies and cryptocurrency is one that's going to be playing out for many decades to come as well.